In this section, we'll take a look at allosteric protein regulators. So, after we just get done going through the rigors of Michaelis Menten kinetics, I have to tell you that life is often not that simple, and many enzymes do not display Michaelis Menten kinetics. They are further regulated through allosteric protein interactions. They will tend to have S shaped curves or sigmoidal plots rather than the standard hyperbolic plot that we saw with the michaelis menten graphs. A good example to look at for comparisons are the hemoglobin and myoglobin proteins. These proteins are not technically enzymes, but they carry and transport oxygen. So we can look at oxygen binding using standard enzymatic curves. Myoglobin is a homolog of hemoglobin. However, it only contains a single polypeptide chain, whereas hemoglobin is a tetramer that contains two alpha and two beta subunits in the adult hemoglobin form. You can see that their ability to bind oxygen varies. Myoglobin shows standard michaelis menten kinetics, whereas hemoglobin shows the sigmoidal curve. If we look more closely at the two proteins, we can see that myoglobin is a holoenzyme that requires a heme prosthetic group. This prosthetic group contains one oxygen binding site, whereas each subunit of the hemoglobin protein contains one of these prosthetic groups for a total of four oxygen binding sites. Here's a closer look at the heme prosthetic group used in both hemoglobin and myoglobin. Notice that the iron metal coordinated at the center of the molecule. This iron helps to coordinate the binding of the oxygen molecule when it docks onto the hemoglobin. This is a schematic visual model of oxygen binding process in hemoglobin. It shows all four monomers of hemoglobin and the hemes. Oxygen's not shown in this model, but for each of the iron atoms, for example, in this upper module here, when oxygen binds, the molecule is going to flex in this direction, and it tugs this histidine residue closer to the iron heme. So you can see that when oxygen binds to the hemoglobin, there's a pretty dramatic shift in the overall three-dimensional structure of the protein. This shift in the protein structure is what causes the sigmoidal shape of the hemoglobin oxygen binding curve. As oxygen binds to the first subunit, it has lower affinity for the oxygen. However, when it does bind, it causes a conformational change in that subunit that we just saw in the last slide. This conformational change also tugs at the neighboring unit, causing it to shift conformation into one that's more favorable for oxygen binding. Thus, the curve ticks upward with the binding of the second molecule of oxygen, and it ticks up more sharply for the third binding. And by the time it gets fully saturated, it's reaching the Vmax stage. This causes the S shape of the curve, and it's known as cooperative binding. So the hemoglobin protein can exist in different conformations that have different binding affinity for oxygen. To distinguish these different binding states, researchers call them the tense or the relaxed state of the enzyme. We will see that this type of terminology for allosteric enzymes is used a lot. The tense state favors inactivity or reduced oxygen binding in the case of hemoglobin and is denoted by the squares, whereas the relaxed state favors oxygen binding and is shown as the circles. This model shows oxygen bound subunits as red, whereas no oxygen bound is clear or white. So when there is no oxygen bound, the protein will strongly favor the tense state. However, as oxygen binds to the molecule, there's going to be a shift in favoring the relaxed state. So you can see that this shift is going to occur more and more with the more oxygens that are bound until when it's fully saturated, most of the protein will then be in the relaxed state rather than the tense state. This can be visualized graphically as the sigmoidal curve or the S-shaped curve which mimics the tense state at the beginning of the reaction, 
and transforms to the relaxed state by the end of the reaction. In between, it is in flux between the two states. Note that the graph here denotes the partial pressure of oxygen within the system, indicating the overall amount of oxygen within the system. In the arterial system, the pressure is higher and keeps hemoglobin saturated, whereas in the venous system, the pressure is lower and the oxygen affinity is reduced. This is important, as we will see that hemoglobin is also responsible for the transport of carbon dioxide back out of the system. Blood in the arteries needs to carry the oxygen to the tissues of the body, whereas the venous blood is returning to the heart and essentially the lungs with the carbon dioxide waste products that need to be released from our body. Without this cooperative nature of hemoglobin, this dynamic would be much harder to do with a single protein. It wouldn't be possible with myoglobin. And notably, myoglobin is an oxygen sequestering protein that's found in muscle tissue. pH is another important factor in hemoglobin oxygen binding dynamics. This effect was first described by Christian Bohr. Yes, Neil Bohr's father. He won the Nobel Prize in Medicine for this discovery. Essentially, what he demonstrated is that oxygen binds hemoglobin more strongly when the pH is more basic, or close to 7.6, rather than 7.2. Note that these minor changes in pH can be sustained in vivo, and they play an important role in hemoglobin dynamics. To think about the basis for this effect, recall three important factors. First, carbon dioxide and bicarbonate exist in equilibrium within biological systems and can affect the overall pH of the system. Second, the deoxyhemoglobin is a stronger base, meaning it can accept a proton than hemoglobin that's bound to oxygen. And third, in red blood cells, or RBCs, there's an enzyme called carbonic anhydrase, which catalyzes the conversion of carbon dioxide into carbonic acid. So that's going to upregulate the amount of protons within the solution, thereby lowering the pH. So as we metabolize oxygen to the waste product of carbon dioxide, that's essentially going to lower the pH within the system. So in our first example, in a muscle during exercise, glucose is going to be converted into carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide then diffuses to the capillaries and the red blood cells and equilibrates via this reaction to the bicarbonate form and the free proton. Some of the side chains of hemoglobin act as a buffer and the protons will bind to the deoxy form of hemoglobin, preventing it from binding to oxygen or in effect causing it to release the oxygen. And here's a second example. The deoxyhemoglobin is transported through the circulatory system back to the lungs where it picks up oxygen. Oxygen shifts the equation back to the left again, generating a proton. The proton then reacts with the bicarbonate, forming the carbonic acid, which can be reconverted back into the water and the carbon dioxide. The carbon dioxide is then exhaled when we breathe out. And it's this reaction here and the discovery of this dynamic that won Christian Bohr the Nobel Prize in Medicine. Overall, analysis of the biological activity of hemoglobin shows that the regulation of a single protein's activity is very complex and it can differ at different locations within the body or when exposed to specific allosteric effectors. So let's take a look at another one of these allosteric effectors, 2,3-bisphosphoglycerate, or 2,3-BPG. At high altitude, the body struggles to get enough oxygen to all the tissues of the body. This is due to decreased oxygen availability when you're up at the top of a mountain. For example, at 14,000 feet, the air has 43% less oxygen than at sea level. And at the top of Mount Everest, there's only 21% of the available oxygen that's available at sea level. So this is known as the death zone. An extended stay above 8,000 meters 
or 26,247 feet on the top of Everest without supplementary oxygen will result in deterioration of the bodily functions and death even within a few hours. So one of the ways that our body helps adapt to combat this issue, although you can't combat the death zone, is to increase an allosteric effector of the hemoglobin protein known as 2,3-bisphosphoglycerate. This can occur in as little as 24 hours after being at higher altitude. The body will also begin increased production of red blood cells, but this process takes a couple of weeks to increase the number of red blood cells in the body. So 2,3-bisphosphoglycerate is essentially a side product that's produced from normal sugar metabolism during glycolysis. Normally, 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate is converted to 3-phosphoglycerate, releasing a molecule of ATP during glycolysis. When you're up at high altitude, some of the 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate will first get converted to 2,3-bisphosphoglycerate. So this is an isomerization reaction, and you're just converting the position of one of those phosphate groups from the 1 position down to the 2 position. So what do you notice here? Binding of the 2,3-bisphosphoglycerate to hemoglobin is actually decreasing the binding affinity of oxygen for the hemoglobin molecule. So this may seem counterproductive at first. However, you can see that the pressure inside the lungs is high enough that you're still getting good saturation of the hemoglobin protein when it's in the lungs. But when you're in the tissues of the body, the hemoglobin when it's bound to 2,3-bisphosphoglycerate is going to be more likely to release that oxygen into the tissue. And this is where you need to deliver it, especially if there's less oxygen available. And you can see that the shift from sea level to high altitude is also going to cause this decrease because you've got decrease in overall oxygen pressure at the higher altitude than you would at sea level. So hemoglobin has another interesting story. There are different alleles of the hemoglobin protein that can be incorporated into the tetramer. In the human fetus, in fact, the makeup of hemoglobin is different than shortly occurs after birth. The prominent form in the fetus contains two alpha subunits and two gamma subunits instead of the beta subunits that's found in the normal adult form of the hemoglobin. So in this case, the fetal hemoglobin is the blue line here, and it shows higher binding affinity for oxygen than the adult hemoglobin. And this makes sense as the fetus will need to sequester oxygen from the mother's bloodstream, and this will help the fetus to grow. One last area that I would like to visit with regards to hemoglobin is the condition of sickle cell anemia that causes red blood cells to go from their nice donut shape into these weird sickle shaped forms. So the most common form of sickle cell anemia is caused by a single mutation in the beta globin gene that causes the replacement of a glutamic acid in the normal wild type protein that's converted to a valine in the mutant form. This shift of a highly polar amino acid with a highly hydrophobic amino acid causes a sticky patch to occur on the hemoglobin protein that wants to be shielded away from the water environment. And this causes multiple hemoglobin proteins to get stuck together in this long clumpy chain within the red blood cell. Normally, hemoglobin just exists as a tetramer free-floating around inside the red blood cell, and it doesn't clump up or bind with other molecules of hemoglobin. This is a problem because these big, long chains now of hemoglobin distort the shape of the red blood cell into this sickle shape. The clumping is worse when low oxygen levels are present such as when a person is working out hard or running, for example. The disease is the worst in patients that have two mutant alleles and only contain 
the beta globin gene with the valine mutation. People that are heterozygous and contain one wild type gene and one mutant gene do not have as many symptoms and are typically thought of as carriers for the disease, although they can suffer from some milder symptoms. Regarding the symptoms, the sickled red blood cells get clumped together and they cannot pass easily through small capillary beds. This can lead to multiple pleiotropic problems for the sickle cell patient. If this happens in the heart, it can cause a heart attack, or in the brain, it can cause a stroke. It can negatively impact the function of other organs as well, such as the liver, the kidney, or the lungs, as well as cause joint pain and muscle cramping. It's really a devastating disease that can seriously reduce life expectancy. Noticeably, the wild-type hemoglobin, shown as HBA in this diagram, and the sickle cell allele, HBS, have different binding affinities for oxygen, with the sickle cell allele having less capacity for carrying oxygen to the tissues. So not only does it get clumpy and cause the sickle cell shape, it's also not delivering oxygen as well to the body tissues. Next week, you will work on an assignment that analyzes other hemoglobin mutations that can also occur in patients that cause forms of sickle cell disease. So overall, Chapter 6 has provided an overview about enzyme activity and the various factors that can cause changes to biological activity. This is very helpful for understanding health, medicine, and disease states. It's also useful for synthetic and industrial purposes as well, such as the lipases and proteases that are commonly found in laundry detergent. Another example is the glucose isomerase enzyme that's used to make high fructose syrups and the use of the lactase enzymes to break down lactose in milk products for lactose intolerant people. These are just to name a few. In the next chapter, we will look at the active site strategies that enzymes use to mediate their catalytic activities.